Good morning. My name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral, and welcome to the Forum. It's such a pleasure to have all of you here. Um, the air quality is so bad, and so I just am grateful when anybody shows up to anything now. <laughs> You risked your lives. They to risked come your here. lives, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and it is worth it. <laughs> um, this year, Grace Cathedral chose as its theme truth, as uh, a kind of theme for inspiration. We talked about the truth about ourselves, the truth about each other, the truth about the world, and about God. Um, and what better topic to finish our year of truth with than scientific truth, the, this focused study of what is true? And what better way to um, do that but the most intimate experience that we have with science, which is in the nutrition and the food that we eat. Our guest today is Professor Emerita of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health at New York University. She earned a PhD in molecular biology, a master's in public health nutrition from the University of California, Berkeley. And she, yep, that's right, yay, go bears. <laughs> Go Bears. Go Bears. <laughs> and she worked on the redesign of the food pyramid in the late 1980s. Her books include Food Politics, Safe Food, Soda Politics, and more recently, Unsavory Truth, How Food Companies Skew the Science of What We Eat, which is the topic of our conversation today. Please join me in welcoming Marion Nessel. <laughs> It's so good to see you today. Um, Marion is um, Rebecca Nestle's mother. And so, nepotism, um, <laughs> this is a full disclosure, full this disclosure. is nepotism. Uh, so we're, we're, we're especially <laughs> delighted to see you because um, last week the forum guests spent about three minutes talking about how great your daughter was. It was well, let's um, do that. Let's rewind it. <laughs> it. It's easy for me too. Um, so, um, what do you say when people ask you about what your favorite foods are? Like, what do you like to eat? Ice cream. Ice cream, huh? <laughs> That's one of my favorites, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm a um, omnivore. Uh, there's a big attack on nutrition science right now, coming from many, many different sides. And one of the attacks is on nutritional epidemiology, and there's a of, of extremely distinguished statistician at Stanford who says that anybody who writes about anything having to do with nutrition science should immediately disclose their dietary preferences oh, wow. and their dietary ideology. So, I'm an omnivore. <laughs> Well, that's good. I'm glad to, I'm, I asked the right question then. <laughs> when you were a child, um, what, um, what impressions did you have about what foods were healthy and which foods were not healthy? Was that something you thought about at all? Or? Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I grew up in a very poor household where um, when, I, when we were living in New York City when I was in sort of early grammar school, I don't remember anything except eating canned food. Yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't that you know, my mother didn't cook. She did cook, but I, don't, I just don't remember anything about it until I went to a summer camp where that was run by a woman who was a fabulous cook, uh -huh. really first class. Yeah. <clears throat> she had lived in China for a long time and knew how to walk vegetables and do things like that. Uh, that was where I discovered it. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> and then you, you went to Berkeley, and how did you become an expert on nutrition? Like, how did, how did that I evolve? I mean, from somebody who hadn't really thought very much about healthy foods as a child to, to being a, an expert on nutrition. Well, that was an accident. I'd, I went to Berkeley interested in food. My mother had a friend who was a cookbook, who was a cookbook collector. Oh, how I wish I had inherited that collection. Oh, yeah, um, right, But right. it was very bizarre at the time, and she had all these cookbooks, and they were kind of interesting. And she said, you like to eat. You should go to Berkeley and study food. Okay, so there, two, there were two options. One was agriculture. I'm a city girl. I didn't know anything about agriculture. That seemed inappropriate. And then the other was dietetics. And so I went to Berkeley as a dietetics major, and I lasted exactly one day. <laughs> and that was the end of that. I mean, they had us in serious science courses. I thought, if I'm taking serious science courses, I'm going to be a serious scientist. Yeah. So why, what, how did it last only a day? I mean, like, what, what, what oh, did it look like? I mean, home economics. Yeah, yeah. It was home economics. Yeah, I can imagine and that. Not very challenging, and yet here we were 
in chemistry, in five credit chemistry classes yeah. with science majors and pre-med majors, and it turned out I could hold my own. Yeah. Um, so I ended up graduating in science and really didn't get back to food until my first teaching job, which was at Brandeis University. And um, I was teaching courses in cell biology, very difficult to teach, really abstract and difficult. And the department had a rule that at the end of three semesters of teaching the same course, you had to change, and you had because they wanted to keep it fresh, and you had to teach anything that the department needed, whether you knew anything about it or not. Really? And I was given a choice of human physiology or human nutrition. I thought physiology, well, that would be interesting, but kidney function is so beyond <laughs> me. I will never understand it, and I promise I still don't understand it. Acid-base balance, it's really tough. Yeah. Um, and so I picked human nutrition, and I was interested. It was the early 1970s, Linus Pauling had oh, just yeah. published Vitamin C in the Common Cold. Francis Moore Lappe, who was right, still right. very much with us, had just published Diet for Small Planet. Yeah, right. And I was curious to know whether there was anything to it. And I thought, well, that would be interesting. Center for Science and the Public Interest had just been founded and they had a book out called Food for People, Not for Profit that I looked at not too long ago and really it could have been published yesterday. Yeah. The issues are still so fresh. And so I thought, okay, those are my textbooks and what we'll do is we'll teach undergraduate biology and I'll ask the students to do the original research, looking up the references and seeing whether they agree with what the arguments are in these books, and we were off and running. Yeah, it's funny, because in, in a way, kind of like a, a, a revolution was happening in terms of how we regard food. I just hadn't thought of, you know, until you named the, 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 the books, that, that that was underway. Just starting. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think every generation thinks it's discovering this um, from scratch, but the, I had 50 students in the class and they were really interested. It was the most exciting biology. It's a great way to teach biology oh, yeah, right. through food. Yeah, it's a, because, care about as it. you put yeah. it, it's the most intimate thing you do. Yeah. You put it in your body. Yeah. And so the students were really engaged and they wrote fabulous papers. Students could write fabulous papers in those days, yeah, undergraduate yeah. students. Yeah. They read. What a concept. <laughs> well, we read this little screen now. <laughs> <laughs> right. What is, in what ways have, have our perceptions of food changed since then? Like, like how do we, uh, uh, you know, what did we think was healthy then, and what do we think is healthy now, and how has that changed? Well, it hasn't. Yeah. You know, in, in the 1970s, everybody was still saying, eat your veggies, don't eat too much um, sugar, salt, f saturated yeah. fat. I mean, it was still there in the 1970s. It hasn't changed yeah. at all. And you know, I'm extremely fond of quoting Michael Pollan, oh, you know, yeah. who says, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Really, it's that simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing exactly. to it. No, nothing to it. Everything else is marketing. Yeah. <laughs> You know, um, there's so many, I mean, everybody in here has got their list of questions, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about artificial sweeteners. Like, uh, like, how do they work and, you know, what effect do they have on us? Um, and what is your recommendation for us as, as, you know, they seem so ubiquitous? I don't have the faintest idea. <laughs> I mean, partly I don't know because most of the research on artificial sweeteners is funded by the companies make that them. make them. And they're chemicals, they're mostly peed out. Um, that means you don't have to worry about them very much. There are lots of ideas that they're really dangerous. I don't know whether they're right or not. I can't tell. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I didn't cover that research in this book. I mostly stuck to food in this book. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to ask, because it was <laughs> outside the realm, just like um, yeah. alcohol was too. Right? Alcohol's outside. GMOs are outside. Or organics are outside. I thought that was a deliberate decision not to talk about those things, because the book would have been too long. I yeah, had a, had a word limit right. from the publisher, yeah. and the publisher enforced that word limit. <laughs> A painful experience. Yeah, no, uh, reading it, I, I completely understood why you had to, to, to narrow it down mm. a little bit. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about just what the thesis of the book, um, uh, just for the people who haven't read sure. it. Sure. Uh, this is a book about food industry funding of nutrition research. Um, I got interested in the topic 
actually 15 years ago, I wrote my first article about it in 2001, I was noticing that whenever food companies funded studies, the studies, by an extraordinary coincidence, came out with results that were just what the funder needed for marketing purposes. And I was noticing this over and over and over again, and I wrote an article about it in 2001. I plagiarized that article to put it into my book, Food Politics, which they have copies of back there. Um, and then I forgot about it. And I didn't start getting interested in it again until I started writing my book, Soda Politics, yeah. when I began noticing all the studies that Coca-Cola was funding. And I could see that Coca-Cola was funding three different kinds of studies. They were funding studies that would show that sugar-sweetened beverages had no effect on obesity or type 2 diabetes, that any evidence that suggested that sugar-sweetened beverages affected obesity or type 2 diabetes was conducted so poorly that you didn't have to pay any attention uh, to it. Yeah. And that physical activity was much more important than what you ate or drank in right. obesity. And I thought, well, that's just amazing. And all of these studies that they publish um, come out with these really that they pay for, come out with these results. And so I wrote about that in Soda Politics, which came out in 2015. But before that, earlier in 2015, while Soda Politics was in press, I started collecting these studies. I started running across them, and some of them made me laugh. I thought they were really funny. And so I would post, every time I had five, I would post them on my website. And I did that for a whole year. What's an example of like a funny study? Oh, one that just came out this week that somebody told me. If you drink beer, it solves problems of Alzheimer's. Oh. <laughs> it was done by Japanese investigators. Guess who the funder was? If you guess Kirin, you guessed right. Uh -huh. Or one that came out two weeks ago that I just love. Um, chewing gum is a great delivery system for vitamins. Wow. This is hilarious. Yeah. Really? Um, you know, who funded that one? Vitaball, a company uh, that makes vitamin supplement chewing gum. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, have you been reading the New York Times this week, the articles about Facebook, and then the articles oh, yes. about um, disinformation from Russia? I don't know if you saw those. Well, actually, that's how I start my book, is yeah. with the disinformation it is, it with is. Russia. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, that was um, the Hillary Clinton emails. That's how I start the book. It was such, they were such a gift. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what they did. To, well, I do know what they did to Hillary Clinton's campaign. But to me, they were the most fabulous yeah. gift. So maybe you can describe how, how they were helpful for you. Um, because th these were the emails that were hacked by the Russians and posted on a new site called DC Leaks. And they included, by coincidence, a collection of emails from uh, somebody who was working with Hillary Clinton, a woman named Patricia Marshall, who, while she was working on Hillary Clinton's campaign, and I still can't figure out what she was doing on that campaign yeah. exactly, um, except she was friend of Hillary, um, she was consulting for Coca-Cola at the tune of $7,000 a month, with a wow. retainer of $7,000 <laughs> a month, amazing. which we know from the emails. Um, wow. and. I got two different people contacted me, a guy named Kyle Fister from a group called Ninjas for Health, whatever that is, <laughs> um, and Russ Green from CrossFit. I had never heard of CrossFit at the time. Um, and they both wrote and said, Marion, you're in the emails. And I said, what? Wow. How is that possible? <laughs> I was just stunned. So I went and looked, and sure enough. And what had happened was, uh, in 2016, at the beginning of 2016, right after Soda Politics came out, I went to Australia to work at the University of Sydney with a woman named Lisa Biro, who used to be here at UCSF, um, and who does who studies conflicts of interest in research in general. And I wanted to know how she did all the work that she did. And while I was there, I gave a talk to the Nutrition Society of Australia, a very very small group of people. Um, and just before my talk, somebody came up and said, you know, there's somebody from Coca-Cola in the audience. Do you care? Yeah. 
And I said, of course not. Yeah. Um, food, soda politics had just come out. I assumed that somebody from Coca-Cola was at every talk I gave. <laughs> and you know who you are. <laughs> right, that's exactly right. Right. So this person had taken notes really good notes, and those notes had been passed up through the Coca-Cola chain of command and ended up in Capricia Marshall's thing. And the notes, um, so there were the notes on my lecture along with recommendations. Pay attention to what she's doing in Australia, monitor her activities, keep track of who she's talking to, and also keep track of what Lisa Biro is doing. Mm -hmm. And Lisa Biro got a front page story in the Sydney Morning Herald about that, about how Coca-Cola was spying on her. Wow. So, so, I, so here were these emails and I thought, yes! The first chapter of my book, I hadn't known how to start it. <laughs> yeah, it was perfect. It was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the spying, it, was it unsettling at first when you first heard the news? That no, you I thought it was, it was funny. Like, it was funny, yeah. I thought yeah. it was really funny. And there's one other funny thing that happened. I spoke earlier this week at the launch of UCSF's new collection of food industry documents that they have in their library um, because the DC Leaks website um, which you can't find anymore because it was taken down. It was taken down a couple of weeks after I had met someone from UCSF and told her, you know, I'm kind of worried. I'm, this is the first chapter of my book. I don't know how to cite these right, things. Exactly. How am I going to cite this is a scholarly book? Yeah. How do I cite these things? And they said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll copy them. And I think within two weeks of the time they copied it, wow, the site was gone. taken down. Yeah. So if you want to read the emails for yourself, <laughs> just go to the, US, the UCSF's website. Right. There they are. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, you know, in the book you talk about the tobacco industry playbook. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that um, mm -hmm. uh, this morning. Yeah, that's the term that was given in the movie Merchants of Doubt and in the book Merchants uh, of Doubt to describe the tobacco industry set of strategies for casting doubt on the research. Um, you know, the tobacco industry long knew that cigarette smoking was associated with lung cancer risk, um, but they thought that if they could cast doubt on the research, then people would continue smoking because there would be enough disbelief about the research so that there would be no reason why they needed to tell anybody to stop smoking yeah. and they wouldn't be regulated and that kind of thing. So the first thing is you do research to cast doubt on the science. You try to disc discredit researchers who are complaining about the effects of your product. Um, you do a lot of marketing. You blame personal responsibility. We're not forcing you to smoke. It's your fault if you smoke. Oh, right. We're not forcing you to drink Coca-Cola. It's your fault if you drink Coca-Cola, and so forth. I mean, yeah. so all of these strategies, and a lot of companies have picked them up. Yeah. And certainly the soda industry has. Yeah, definitely. Um, if you had to describe, like, I mean, there's so many different kinds of food myths. Like, what are the three main food myths that, that about food and health that that that, that um, you see out in? The well, the one that bothers me the one the most is the one that it changes all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it. I mean, I hear that constantly. Oh, yes, I don't I do know what to that. eat. The advice right. changes. Sometimes all the they time. say your eggs are good, and sometimes they say margarine right. is good. And exactly, yeah, exactly. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. That right, doesn't change right. at all. And not artificial food. Yeah, real yeah. food. Real food. Um, eat a variety of healthy foods. You know the. the American Heart Association has just published a study um, saying that variety makes you fat. But that's, <laughs> oh, come on. Um, variety has always referred, you know, variety moderation, two yeah. basic principles of nutrition. It's always referred to healthy foods, yeah. a variety of relatively unprocessed foods. You talked a little bit at the very beginning, just almost like that disclosure about what your own food eating habits are. I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about vegan veganism and vegetarianism. I, I, you know, I just seem like I see a lot more vegans than I did, mm -hmm. you know, 50, 20 years Well, those ago. are healthy diet patterns. They yeah. really are. Uh, I mean, there's an extraordinary amount of information that people who eat, they're, you know, 
mostly plants. That's one of the basic principles. Uh, yeah. um, so vegetarian diets are healthier than the typical American diet. And um, a lot of people who are concerned about their health eat vegetarian diets. Um, and then they, take, they go a step further and don't eat any animal products at all, either because of the effects of those products on their health or because of concerns about the effect of animal raising on the environment or because they think it's immoral to eat right, animals. Right. Um, but I'm an omnivore. Yeah, yeah. I don't eat a lot of meat, but I do eat meat. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I thought I needed to completely disclose everything that I had to disclose because if any, if I, if you write a book like this and you're trying to hide something and somebody finds out about it, you'll hear about it yeah. big time. So everything is on the table in this one. Yeah, yeah, and that's part of your recommendations for for food science in general for the future mm, is just to be right. more transparent. Yeah, transparency is very helpful, yeah. although it's not sufficient for. Um, dealing with the effects of food industry funding. And I should say that the big surprise to me in doing this book was the enormous body of research on the effects of gifts. Oh, when yeah. I went to Berkeley, we studied the quackyoodles and patterns of yeah, culture right. and that kind of thing. I didn't the pay close potlatches. I didn't pay <laughs> close enough attention to that. I should have listened to you. <laughs> no. I took the um, same class. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but the the rec you know the the enormous body of research on the effect of industry funding on health, which has mostly been done for cigarettes, chemicals, and pharmaceutical drugs, and I reviewed the literature on pharmaceutical drugs, says that the influence of these gifts occurs unconsciously. The recipients of, these, of the funding don't realize that it influences them. They didn't intend for it to influence them. They aren't venal selling out, we're going to take the money and we'll do anything that right, the company right. wants. It isn't anything like that. It occurs at an unconscious level. That makes it really hard to deal with. Yeah. You know, um, Robert Sapolsky was here earlier this, um, two months ago, the Stanford um, primatologist, and was talking about just how even in, it takes a milliseconds for us to recognize someone's race, that we're constantly uh, aware of so much The more. unconscious exactly. things that it's go huge. on. Yeah. So it's very human to do this. And so the observe, there, there are two observations um, that, or actually three, that you know, sort of come through in this book over and over and over again. One is that industry-funded studies come out with results that favor the sponsor's interest, and there's very systematic research that shows that. The second is that the influence occurs unconsciously, yeah. unintentionally, it's unrecognized and usually denied. And then the place where the bias comes into the research is in the research question. Um, and that was interesting too. And then I started thinking, I get these letters all the time from trade associations saying, um, we have $35,000 and we're offering $35,000 grants for research studies that will demonstrate the benefits of yogurt, grapes, pecans, cashews, macadamia nuts, anything that you can think of. Blueberries. Blueberries, ah yes, blueberries. <sighs> and there's a big difference between asking for research studies to demonstrate the benefits of and research studies that are open-ended and asking for proposals to demonstrate the effects of. Right. Those are two very different research questions. It's really easy to design a study to demonstrate benefits. And there was just a fabulous example published in the New York Times where five big alcohol companies, the, the owners yeah, right. of you know, brands of alcohol, hard liquor and uh, wine and beer, got together and gave the National Institute of Health Foundation $67 million to do a study to demonstrate that one drink a day reduced the risk of heart disease. Mm -hmm. And it was almost that baldly stated. Um, the New York Times wrote an article about the study when it still looked like it was open-ended and wrote the article as if it were an open-ended study, let's find out the results of one drink a day on health, but she got a tip wow. from somebody at the Alcohol Institute who said, 
this study is intended to demonstrate that one drink a day will reduce the risk of heart disease. So she used Freedom of Information Act to get all these emails and was able to show that somebody at the NIH was collaborating with the alcohol industry and had essentially promised the alcohol funders that this study would not show any harm of alcohol and they would get exactly the result that they paid for. Um, when these uh, investigative reports were published, the NIH investigated and then stopped the trial. Yeah. Um, but it's real, and then the, um, the reporter explained how the study was designed mm. to give the result that they wanted. It excluded people, it excluded women who might be at risk for breast cancer, for example. Right, right. It didn't run the study long enough and it made sure that anybody who was at high risk for heart disease wasn't was involved, yeah. you know, was, was screened out. Right, exactly. Piece of cake. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, um, you, you write a lot about just what the food industry can learn from the drug industry, and, or the scientists, food scientists can learn from drug scientists. I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that, because, I mean, there are just like structural differences in terms of just, you know, there are things that make it easier to regulate drugs. And maybe you can just um, describe that. For, for well, us. everything with drugs is measurable. Um, you know, you can look at what happens to, you can measure prescription practices of an individual physician before and after a drug detailer comes to a hospital and talks about the benefits of a brand name drug. The object of the game for drug companies is to get people to buy expensive brand name drugs rather than cheap generics that might actually work better. Right. Um, and so, because the drug stuff is measurable, it's one drug, one product, one prescription, you can do these kinds of studies, and many, many, many have been done. In fact, there are thousands of studies, literally thousands of studies, of the effect of drug industry marketing practices on physicians' prescription practices, and unfortunately, opinions on advisory committees. Um, and then in 2010, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, um, the Affordable Care Act includes a provision that drug companies are required by law to fully disclose and to put online, on an online website, um, exactly who they give money to. The hospitals they give money to, the medical institutions they give money to, and the individual physicians that they give money to. So you can look at the prescription practices of an individual physician and then go and look and see who that physician gets money from. And that's been done over and over and over and over again. Hundreds of studies since uh, 2010. And in fact, there was a, another New York, I'm a, you know, I live in New York, I read the New York Times. There was another New York Times front page story about a, a senior cancer researcher at uh, Sloan Kettering who was promoting a, ca a particular cancer drug and did not disclose mm. that he had financial ties to the company that made that drug. This was on the front page of the New York Times because somebody went to this website and looked it up. Oh, right, right. No big deal. Yeah. You can look it up. Yeah. You know, it's right there on the website. You just type in the person's name and up it comes. Yeah. And so the Times published a graph of the 25 or 30 drug companies this particular guy wow. went for. And now Sloan Kettering has had to do a deep examination of its relationships with pharmaceutical companies. But you can't do that for food. Food isn't one product. People eat dozens or hundreds of different kinds of foods within a given week. Yeah, yeah. And to look at one food in the context of very complicated diets is much harder to do. I think nutrition research is much more intellectually challenging than a lot of these things. It's really hard to do. Yeah. Um, so it's, that's why I say that any time you see a study where one food is proposed as a superfood or something miraculous, you really should roll your eyes. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's definitely something I, I learned from Rebecca and from the book, too. It's just, if superfood <laughs> is just not a good, it's, it's a... It's a it, well, um, Rebecca do, reads proof on all of my books because she's fabulous she proofreader. She fabulous proofreader. <laughs> she really is. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the Trump administration, you're talking about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, like, like, what effect will the Trump administration have on the foods we eat and our understanding of... 
of, of nutrition. Well, I've been food. keeping a list. It's a, <laughs> That's good. It's, I a, <laughs> it's a very long uh -huh. list. In almost every area of food and nutrition policy, the Trump administration is doing really bad things. We don't know how it's going to... The big one, of course, is the food stamp program, SNAP. Uh -huh. um, and we don't know how that's going to come out, but it won't be good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I just, um, you know, part of what you describe in the book is just, you know, how, um, how competitive scientific research is, and, um, and, and that seems like it would be one way that would, you know, um, you know to just to try to keep your lab going, and I mean, there just seems like a lot of pressure on scientists. Oh, it's are, terrible. You know. I, I mean, first of all, there are a lot of scientists, and with all of the money crunch, particularly at public institutions, uh, I mean, I talked to... Actually, I talked to somebody at Stanford this week who told me that he doesn't get a full salary from Stanford. Uh, he has to raise his own salary. Yeah. That means he's got to get grant after grant after grant, not only to pay his own salary, but to pay the salaries of the people that are working with him on his projects. Right. Um, I was very fortunate. I worked at a university where my tenured, and let me tell you how important tenure was. <laughs> if you're going to write about controversial topics, it's really great to have tenure. Uh, uh. You know, e even my university expects new faculty to bring in grants yeah. um, for the overhead that, that comes with the grants, for the prestige that comes with the grants, and then if they want to pay people to help them, they've got to bring in the money. Um, and federal funding has flattened out. Um, so the food industry has moved into the gap. Yeah, yeah. But I think the research is very different because the food industry mainly funds marketing studies. They're not funding basic research. Right, right. Um, so it's a big problem. Yeah, it is. And I, like, like I said, I mean, if if that um, if the federal the money that comes from governmental sources is declining, it, it's just hard to see how. And you have to raise the money for your own salary. Yeah, that's pretty bad. It is. It that's is. That's pretty bad. It's almost like a, it's a the the setup. Make, it makes it almost impossible to succeed. Yeah, I mean, it it made me realize over and over again how privileged I was to work at a university where I was full professor with tenure, got a full salary and which my university thinks that the kind of work that I do is what people in universities ought to be doing. I work at New York University and it has a big outside engagement program, very involved in the community, very involved in the global, what they call the global university. It's got branches all over the world. So they like what I do. That was fortunate. What I can th think of lots of places I might have been where they might not have. Well, yeah, I mean, so I... I UCSF, for example. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's different <laughs> no. places that have different cultures, yeah. too. Um, can you talk a little bit about, like, what f breakthroughs you might see in the future of kind of nutrition studies? Like, what, do you think we're, we're about to learn something? Like, how is eating going to change in the course of our, my children's life? Well, I, I don't... Will we, like, eat those little Woody Allen pills I don't, I don't have future? a crystal ball. <laughs> I really don't. Yeah. I mean, I can say that the hot areas in nutrition right now have to do with the microbiome. Um, so what does that mean? Well, that's the, the population of bacteria that live in your, in your guts, small yeah. and large intestine. Um, and there's a lot of very exciting research going on there. I don't know what it means yet, but it's very exciting. Um, and so that's one area. Techno foods are another. Uh, Silicon Valley has a huge investment in trying to um, figure out food products that are going to solve nutritional problems for people. I don't think the people in Silicon Valley have much of a palate. Um, <laughs> have any of you ever tasted Soylent? Um, no. What <laughs> Soylent is this... Um, this drink that you make up that's supposed to meet all your nutritional oh, needs in one drink. Um, you need a better name than that, I think. Well, I think they thought it was cute. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, based on the movie where you ate people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's creepy. And um, we did a taste test in my department, and the general conclusion was that Soylent tastes like uncooked can pancake batter. <laughs> but, um, but people love it. Mm -hmm. They're not foodies. Yeah. So I don't know. There's a big attempt to try to replace food with artificial, right. technical things. The um, plant-based meat and the lab-based meat uh -huh. are very, very hot topics right now uh, to solve problems of meat eating for people who don't want to eat meat. 
I sort of don't get that either because if you don't want to eat meat, you don't have to. You can meet your nutritional requirements right. without eating meat. Um, so I'm, I don't know. They're interesting trends. I'm not very excited about any yeah. of them. I like food. Yeah, real food. Real food, <laughs> yeah. It grows in the earth. Yeah, that I can grow on my terrace in Manhattan. <laughs> So um, one of our practices here is that we um, have we take questions. Um, so ah. people have a little note card, mm -hmm. and um, Rebecca will be um, gathering up all the questions. Um, but uh, I, I I've been thinking so much just about um, uh, as I was reading your book and 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 just wondering, you know, as you come to realize what people think about food in ways that they're, they're kind of demythologizing their understandings of food is that are there other corollaries other places in society where you're you're less confident of people's observations or the things that people know about oh i think there's plenty to be concerned about in people's understanding of food yeah i mean i talk to people all the all the time who are so anxious about their diets yeah. they can practically not function. And I just wish that everybody would just relax a little bit and enjoy their food. Yeah, that's good. Um, because it's one of life's greatest pleasures. It's certainly one of mine. Yeah, definitely, you know. definitely. Have there been any, I mean, you, you've talked about just like the role of the corporate interests and in, 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 um, scholarship. Um, do you feel comfortable talking about any ways where you felt like a challenge as a researcher um, from, from um, some corporate interest? Well, actually, I've only had Two. One, um, there was a challenge from the sugar industry uh, when food politics came out oh, in you. 2002. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I tend to think these things are really funny. Um, the sugar industry had heard me say on a radio program that, um, you know, you, if the first thing you should do if you were worried about obesity would be to stop drinking soft drinks because they contain sugar and water and nothing else. And they wrote and said, you as a nutritionist should know better than that. Soft drinks don't contain sugar. They contain high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> <laughs> when I got up off the floor because I was <laughs> laughing so hard, I talked to somebody about it and they said, it's not funny, it's really serious. They're um, preparing a veggie libel suit against you. You need to talk to a lawyer, you have to talk to a libel lawyer, you need to write a very careful response. So I did all that and I have that letter is posted on my website, foodpolitics.com, I think way at the bottom of the media section. Um, and I did that, I never heard from them again, but I did run into the uh, head of the Sugar Association at a meeting a few months later. And I said, you know, I show your letter in every talk that I give yeah. and I've just been having so much fun with it. <laughs> and, he, and he said quite stiffly, we're just glad you're speaking more precisely now. So <laughs> I now say sugars plural oh. instead of sugar oh. and that takes care of it and i've had one challenge to unsavory truth that i can't talk about because it's yeah. under litigation oh, right, right now right. but it's somebody who was quite unhappy about what i had said i was very happy with what you said so <laughs> hope it balances out a little bit um how are our fda regulations on food labeling and how can they be improved well, they're not, I mean, I don't even know where to start. No, but when the FDA first published the current food label, Nutrition Facts and the Ingredient List, and that was in 1993, if you go and read the FDA uh, Federal Register Notice, which is about eight or 900 pages in very small print, Buried in those pages is a description of why they picked that particular design. And my reading of that description is that they focus group tested a bunch of designs and nobody could understand any of them. And they picked the one that was least poorly understood. Oh, wow, yeah. Now they can't change it because a lot of people know how to read this label, and so if they changed it, it would make it more difficult. But they've just, um, the new rules for the label have just come in, and the, there are some improvements. Yeah. Calories will be bigger, fat will be less, um, added sugars will be there. Uh, I, I mean, it's not the label I would have done. I'm, it's about nutrients, not food. I think we really need advice about food, not nutrients. And 
it's I would I would do it completely differently, but they didn't ask. <laughs> Do you believe there can be a singular global paradigm for diet, or is a profile approach necessary? How does one navigate the landscape of food research and information, other than looking at sources of funding? Well, I, you know, I have some sort of general guidelines for interpreting nutrition research. If you've got access to the actual research studies, you can look them up and see that uh, there's a disclosure statement on most journals require funding disclosure, so you can look it up. But most people don't have access to those journals unless you have access to a really good library that gets them. Um, so you rely on the press to tell you about the study. And there are some things that I think send red flags in the air. Breakthrough, that's not how science works. Miracle, sorry, not that easy. Um, my favorite is everything you thought you knew about nutrition is wrong. Every time I hear that, the hair on the back of my neck <laughs> stands up. <laughs> and I think, what are they trying to put over on me? Right. Um, and there was one of those this week, actually, that came out about low-carb diets. Um, be cautious yeah, in yeah. those situations. I mean, if you just think about it for a minute, one food is not going to make that much difference in your life. Um, especially if it's a food like a soft drink or chocolate. I'm sorry about chocolate. It's, how many of you think that chocolate, the dark chocolate is a health food? <laughs> <laughs> That's Mars's hundreds of millions of dollars um, but from Mars to convince people that chocolate is a health food, that dark chocolate has flavanols and they're really good for you. Even Mars, which uh, I met with Mars, I, I meet with food industry executives often, and I met with executives from Mars, and they said, the new gener it's a privately held company, and mm -hmm. so there's a new generation of owners, and the new generation of owners are a little embarrassed about chocolate as a health food. They're no longer advertising or marketing um, M&Ms as health foods. They're, <laughs> they're now... Um, they're now saying that flavanol supplements are going to help you and they're funding studies of flavanol supplements. Never mind. Oh, great. I um, can't wait to learn more about flavanols. I'm going to look that up. Uh, um, um, I read no, uh, thoughts on the China study and or the plant-based diet um, advocacy inspired? Yeah, I'm um, you know, in favor of plants. So across the board, and the um, and I'm as Colin Campbell, who wrote the China study, um, you know his promotion of plants, I, I totally favor. I draw the line. I think he he goes a little far on dairy foods or poison. Um, that seems a little extreme to me. You know, if you want to eat dairy foods like everything else, they're a food. They, I don't think they have any special properties. I totally agree with him that they should not be promoted for people who are lactose intolerant or allergic to the proteins or whatever. But they're food. Lots of people eat them. And I did confess that I'm quite fond of ice cream. <laughs> I'm also quite fond of yogurt and cheese. I like yogurt, too. Yeah. So, so I, I draw the line there. But I do agree with him about the plan. What about how? Uh, what about how First Lady Obama, uh, uh, Michelle Obama, the, and food and her school and work? There's not a lot of. There's some words in between. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm a big fan. But how could I not be? Uh, you know, my my feeling about Michelle Obama was there's somebody in the White House who cares about the same issues I do. This is thrilling. Yeah. Totally thrilling. Um, I thought her focus on childhood obesity was brilliant. And what I didn't know and have never gotten a satisfactory answer for was whether she thought that childhood obesity would be an easy bipartisan issue. Doesn't everybody want kids to be healthy? Yeah, right. Or whether she knew how controversial it would be. And I'm told that she knew, but I'm not sure I believe yeah. that. Um, but in any case, I was for it and was really distressed at the pushback on it. Yeah, because yeah. shouldn't we all care about the health of children? Oh, yeah. Shouldn't we all want kids to have healthy food in schools? Duh. Yeah. It seemed pretty straightforward to me. Yeah. So I was a big supporter. Where do you buy your groceries in New York City? <laughs> um, you know... You're so lucky in California, 
You have no idea how lucky you are. You're so spoiled. Um, I buy at the farmer's market what I can. Okay, it's snowing. The farmer's market's still there, but it doesn't have much fresh fruit or vegetables. Brussels sprouts. Um, <laughs> we've got Whole Foods, now owned by Amazon, but they have pretty reasonable stuff in it. Yeah. Although, if the vegetables come from California, they don't taste the same. In my book, What to Eat, which came out in 2006, I tracked. I, I couldn't understand why broccoli in, in New York tasted so different from broccoli in California. I just couldn't understand it. And so I was able to, I worked with some people at Whole Foods. They were nice enough to let me talk to their produce manager right, out right. here. And they instructed him to be forthcoming. And so I said, how long does it take to get broccoli from that warehouse in Salinas where I ate broccoli and discovered it was sweet, really, um, to my local grocery store in Manhattan? And he said, two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's what we're up against. Right. I grow food on my terrace in Manhattan. Um, and I have a very nice terrace, and it's in pots. I have blueberries, raspberries. I put in a fig tree which died. I put in a peach tree this year. That's the triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> um, I've got strawberries, tomatoes, lettuce, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Here's a question. Yeah. What, um, what do you, how do we become more aware of the soil in which we grow our food? You read books by Daphne Miller, um, mm -hmm. who is a physician in Berkeley who writes books about the connection between the microbiome and health and soil and health. So. What do you think of Dan Buettner's blue zones, how they work, and the nine lessons he has discerned from them? Well, obviously, I follow them. <laughs> you must, because... Here I am. I, I'm not. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, he writes about populations where people live a long time. Though so I follow my own dietary advice. I eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Uh, that leaves lots of room for junk food, and lots of room for eating what I like. Yeah. Just not in huge amounts. Yeah. And not every day. The food pyramid that is taught in public schools. How do we um, pursue the truth? Not everyone needs milk. Not everyone needs milk. This is true. We're not using the pyramid anymore. We now use a plate. And one of the intriguing things that's going on with the Trump administration is that they have not reissued the food guide. Um, so the, the current My Plate is based on the 2015, no, it's based on the 2010 dietary guidelines. There's been no new food guide since um, 2010. And the 2015-2020 dietary guidelines did not um, do a new food guide. But for the current, the, we're doing another set of dietary guidelines. I'm so bored. Um, and they, the committee is being appointed. Oh, do I feel sorry for them. They'll be <laughs> under so much scrutiny. Um, and there will be a new food guide. Um, and the old one ended up with a glass of milk off to the side. Oh, yeah. Couldn't get rid of the dairy. It wasn't possible. But I dislike the plate enormously because the plate has four quadrants. It's got one for fruits and vegetables, one for grains, one for protein. That's the one that drives me crazy. Uh, protein? That's a chef's term. Um, you know, uh, grains have protein, vegetables have protein, dairy right. products have protein. Yeah. Why is there a special section for protein? I don't get it. It's almost like apples and oranges, compa comparing different things. Yeah, I don't things. get it. Yeah. I just don't get the whole thing. But it, once again, they didn't ask me. Yeah. Actually, they did, but they didn't listen. <laughs> 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 what would yours have been? Oh, food, you know, just a bunch of food. Yeah. I mean, eat food, not too much. <laughs> I mean, really, it comes down to that. All right, politics, rules, laws. If you could accomplish one thing with Congress in the next two years, what would that thing be? <laughs> oh, dear. Um, how about a really great program for helping people get enough food? 
a really great one. That's the number one problem in our society. The number two problem is overeating. Um, and I think there's a lot that the Congress could do to regulate the food industry, to try to make um, food portions smaller, to try to make food products healthier. But this administration is not likely to do any of that. So um, there's another question underneath this. It's, so it's that or, if Democrats ask your advice on the as one aspect of US food policy, laws, regulations, et cetera, to add, delete, or change, what would that one thing be? Well, it would be to do something about food insecurity. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, you know, there are th or climate change. There are three big food problems. I'm a public health person. So here's basic public health nutrition. There are three problems. Number one, food insecurity. Number two, obesity and its consequences. Number three, the impact of our food production and consumption system on climate change. And those are the things we should be dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah, and the influence of climate change on the food production system, too. And of the food production system on climate right. change, right. Um, which, which is where meat comes in. Yeah. You know, the, the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee attempted to say it would be better for you to eat less meat because it would be healthier to eat less meat and it would be better for the planet. Um, and there was an enormous uproar about that. They had the word sustainability in the in their scientific report and that was taken out by oh, the agencies um, so oh. you're not allowed to it's the s word you're not allowed to mention it oh my gosh how or where do we find out the real truth about certain foods and their related research for example dr campbell in his book the china study proves that dairy protein causes cancer he does not prove it i'm sorry but other people don't agree i'm one of them <laughs> <laughs> how do regular people know what to believe me, of course. <laughs> I don't know what to answer. I don't know how to answer that question beyond the facetious. Um, you know, I read a lot. I read really a lot. Um, I read probably 10 or 15 newsletters a day. I read journals, lots of them. Um, lots of stuff gets sent to me. I've been at this for 45 years. By this time, I have a feel for what I think is right and a feel for... Um, what I think is not right, and I don't think that one food can be responsible for chronic disease or lots of other foods, even though that food may not be healthy and if eaten in large amounts is a big problem. Um, I just don't think we have the evidence that backs that up. We have evidence for dietary patterns, but they're much harder to study. And and I really cannot emphasize enough what an intellectual challenge nutrition research is because you are looking at the effects of diets that are enormously complex, differ from day to day in one individual and differ enormously between one individual and another. How do you get information about what people eat? How do you make an average on that? This is really difficult to do, and all of the methods for doing it are deeply flawed. They're deeply flawed, and the nu nutrition scientists are well aware of those flaws. They try to compensate for them to the extent that they can, um, and they're doing the best they can with the information that's available. So some would argue that because the evidence can never be precise, you will never have a randomized controlled trial that's going to solve an issue. Um, that we shouldn't make any public health recommendations at all. Others, like me, would argue we know enough to know that eat food, not too much, mostly plants, is probably a pretty good approach. Um, don't eat too much processed food. Don't eat too much in general. That would make a big difference. And you don't have to worry about it, whether it's carbs, fats, or anything else. You don't have to worry about artificial sweeteners because you're not eating anything artificial or you're not eating much. Right. Um, and you don't have to worry about those things. The, uh, a variety of healthy foods takes care of your nutrient needs. You, you don't need to be concerned about them. You mostly need to deal with the, with the problem that we have in our society, which I think is the biggest nutrition problem, which is that we live in a food environment in which food companies are trying to get us to eat more of their products mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. There's too much food around. 
Yeah, you said there's some 2,000, we each need 2,000 calories to live, and there's 4,000 worth of calories worth Right, of I mean, that's my starting point yeah. for this discussion, is that on average, men, women, little tiny babies per capita need about 2,000 calories a day. We've got 4,000 available. This makes the food industry hugely competitive. They've got to sell their food, and they sell their food through advertising and marketing, $30 billion a year probably, just in the United States. Um, for That's for food, food products, alcohol, restaurants, everything. Um, that's a lot of money. You know, and I'm fond of picking out one particular figure, $30 million a year to advertise Pop-Tarts just in the United States, just through advertising agencies. Wow. You know, there's no... No, no wonder, every time I have a Pop-Tart, I'm kind of disappointed. <laughs> 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 like, this isn't as good as it was supposed to be. <laughs> You've solved that problem for me. <laughs> well, there you go. $30 million in 2016 to get you to think that it would be delicious. <laughs> well, right. Um, so, I mean, that's what you're up against, and that's the big problem that individuals have to deal with, is trying to cope with an envir a food environment in which too much food is given to you all the time. Yeah. How do you deal with it? You've got to figure that out. Yeah. Otherwise, you eat too much. Right. Um, what do you eat for breakfast? I'm not a breakfast <laughs> eater. Um, I don't get... I don't get hungry until... I don't start... I, I think you should eat when you're hungry. I don't start getting hungry until around 11, and then I want to eat, and then I really want to eat. Yeah. How so. about hydroponic grown food? Well, you know, I used to be an enormous skeptic, and I still am, until I went to Aero Farms in Newark. Uh, the Aero Farms factory is the biggest thing I've ever seen, multiple, multiple football fields, racks of things up to the ceiling, um, and they're growing uh, let it, mostly greens. They're growing greens in on these platforms where they spray them with nutrients wow. and their lights on and every everything is measured and balanced and tested and tested. But then I tasted them and they were fabulous. Really tasty, greens, peppery, um, interesting, lots of strong flavors. And I thought, boy, they're really producing a decent product here. Um, they, and they're selling it. Um, and the only real problem that they have to solve, I think, is the energy problem. They're using a lot of energy right, to grow those things. And, you know, the argument is that you can't get these fresh vegetables to cities. They're getting fresh vegetables to Newark, of all places. And the... Um, and I thought doing a really good, I was very impressed, yeah. very impressed. They have to solve their energy problem. Yeah, definitely. They're working on it. Wow, that's so interesting for the future of... Solar panels. Yeah. Newark, they've got uh, snow on them. They don't work when they've got snow on them. Oh, how funny. Uh, the whole time you were talking, I was thinking Newark, California, and you were thinking... No, no, no! <laughs> Newark, New Jersey! Oh, they don't have snow in Newark? <laughs> Industrial area, Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> Which study has had the most adverse effect on American public health? I never, I've never been asked that question before. So, I don't have an answer for it. I'm going to have to think about it. Um, why do you think that um, there are more occurrences of food sensitivity and new allergies now than in the past? Oh, there's no question that that's happening, and nobody knows. The leading hypothesis, which I find very hard to believe, is that we're too clean. Um, really? When I was growing up, when my kids were growing up, nobody was allergic to peanuts. I mean, it was virtually unheard of. Uh, now, lots and lots and lots of people are allergic to peanuts. I don't know why. Yeah. There's a big argument about whether you should feed peanuts to little babies right away. Uh, the Israelis certainly think so. They've got this product that I can't remember the name of. It's sort of peanut puffs, and it's one of those things that everybody in Israel feeds to babies, and there's no peanut allergy in in Israel to speak of. Um, so, and there's been research funded by that company that shows. Right. <laughs> I figured that might, though. 
what can I say? But nobody really knows. It's yeah. a great mystery. So kids are kept too clean. Nobody lets them play in dirt. The, they don't, they're not exposed to farms. Kids who grow up on farms don't have as many al allergies. Th that's the kind of descriptive evidence, but I don't think anybody knows. F let your kids eat dirt. <laughs> are organic foods from other countries reliable? For example, from countries with a history of food counterfeiting, such as China. Well, it's, they're supposed to follow the same regulations as we follow here. And I have talked to people at Driscoll's, for example, um, which yeah. produces organic berries in Mexico about the, st you know, I, first, my first question was then was how do they produce anything in Mexico that doesn't make people sick when you can't drink the water in Mexico. And they said, well, they purify the water that they use for watering. You know, I mean, they, they've got it under control. They're, they're not interested in developing foods, poisoning and, you know, and poisoning their customers. They don't want to do that. Um, so they claim they use exactly the same yeah, standards. Yeah. I don't know whether they do or not. I tend to take things on face value until proven otherwise. Somebody else is going to have to prove it otherwise. There certainly have been examples of fraud. Yeah. Um, but I don't know the answer. Without checking, you wouldn't know. What do you most want us to all take away from this conversation that we've had with you? There's been so many things that have come up, and um, I, I wonder what you, what you hope that is our kind of lasting impression of this. Well, the lasting impression from the book is I'd like people to be skeptical of industry-funded research, no matter which industry and, um, and no matter what the research is about. In general, I just wish people would enjoy their food more. <laughs> Oh, well, great. I'm going to take your advice because <laughs> I get hungry about 10 o'clock every day. <laughs> and really, there's no evidence. Oh, breakfast is a perfect example. Most of the research that breakfast is shown uh, that breakfast is the most important meal of the day was funded by Kellogg's. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I like breakfast too. <laughs> yeah. So today is the last um, day in the fall season of the forum. Um, we're doing a book group. We're reading Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility. And we're going to discuss that book group on um, December 5th, Wednesday, December 5th at 7 o'clock. So you're welcome to join me for that. Um, you're also welcome to join us for the 11 o'clock service upstairs. Um, we depend on your generosity. So if you can, please make a gift on your way out the door. And I think Marion's going to be um, signing books at the, the back table. So you may have a more precise question that I didn't get to, um, but she'll be able, available to answer those questions questions too. Um, I'm so glad to um, have you here and we're, we're so grateful that you, you made this stop on, on your on trip out here. But to say that it was a pleasure is an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <Thank you. laughs> Thanks.